All right, hello, welcome to our presentation on Davis Bacon and certified payroll. We have Greg Hansen here today from and myself from Project Solutions. Um, we're working with the South Dakota Department of Transportation to um, bring you some tips mm -hmm. on certified payroll and Davis Bacon and how it applies. Greg's um, going to be our expert today, and um, why don't you? Well, take right, it I'm an expert, I guess. And my expertise has <laughs> developed from visiting with a lot of you, our companies like you over the years, and learning and uh, attending presentations like this. And so, you know, some of this we've learned in, um, like I said, talking to firms who have had issues or trouble getting it put together. So um, we thought well, this would be a great topic to put in our library of um, things that a, the small business, anybody in construction needs to know, but certified payroll, if you're doing um, revealing wage work, this is this is important. So. And at any time, if you have questions during the presentation, after the presentation, on another day, um, please reach out to us. We're here to help with this. Uh, a little disclaimer here. This is a general information and only should be used as a guideline for interpreting Davis-Bacon. So there's there's lots of information very specific about, you know, we'll talk, we'll touch on some of the common areas, but the, um, what is, what is, what jobs, are covered by Davis Bacon when what's not. You know, so you're gonna, I just, we just wanna put that out there. This is an overview of it and you're gonna wanna learn more as it applies to your business. So we, we rolled it into what we call seven steps. So, you know, somebody can make it 20 or, or but we, we we call it seven. So, well, the, here, step one, um, you know, one thing you gotta do is you have to have this poster uh, posted at, at, your, at, your, at your place of business or at the job site. Uh, you'll need to fill in the government agency contracting officer contact information. So if somebody wants to you know, um, raise an issue, they, they know who to contact. On another piece of paper, you'll need to list each of the classifications relevant to that project, the type of jobs that are being performed, along with the prevailing wage and the fringe benefit payments that are required. So that the, this is to allow the employees on the job site to readily see what the jobs are and what wages they are entitled to, and make sure that they're, you know, their paychecks. Um, um, you might also see um, uh, the CWHSSA Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act um, poster is sometimes um, OSHA regulations as well. So, so step one, you, you got to get this poster and have it at the job site or the job trailer, so everybody who's working can see what the prevailing wage are. Wages are. Another part of that step one is um, is education. It's important that uh, you educate yourself, your administrative team, if that's just a handful of people, or or, or no matter how, how many people you have, um, they have to know the rules. Another, also the people in the field. If you have superintendents and foremen, even every worker needs to know the rules and be informed. And what are the roles that these people in your team uh, play in making sure your company is compliant? Uh, the, our state DOT website has great resources on this, and so does uh, at the federal level. You know, so you know, you need to know what the minimum pay rates and benefits are. Um, you know, typically these are higher wages than workers are getting paid on non-federal projects. And what job titles are covered and which ones aren't? Timekeeping requirements. Gosh, you know, we, we see. People struggle with this, and this is a this is where it all starts: is getting the right getting the right pay uh, payroll sheets, timekeeping records together. Now, here's an example: you know, in the morning the person might be driving a truck, uh, midday they might be an equipment operator, somewhere they might be a, a laborer. You know, those are all three different pay scales, and you need to have the timesheet documenting that. So, uh, a little FYI there that you know the you can't just put down that I worked eight hours this day or 10 hours, whatever. You have to have proof of clock in and clock out. This is the, just Davis Bacon. So um, you know, there's, we'll talk about some timekeeping mechanisms here in a minute, but you you can't just have bulk hours. You have to have the, the, the detail clock in and clock out. And the prime contractor is responsible for the subcontractor's compliance. If your company is a subcontractor, the prime is responsible. You know, so make sure your company doesn't become a burden to the prime and it's easy to do business with. We're going to 
wrap that up. We'll talk more about that. You know, so step one, educate yourself and your team. Make sure everybody knows what the rules are. Okay. Uh, step two, uh, know the prevailing wage and the benefits. Uh, the base hourly rate, uh, you'll see that acronym, that BHR from time to time, and fringe rates, FR. Uh, they're usually published or attached to the contract, and they're called wage determinations or prevailing wage terminology. And know what job classifications your company are, will be, what functions your workers will be doing. You know, obviously a laborer gets paid a lower rate than a concrete finisher or a form setter. Uh, drivers who uh, might drive different types of truck or different sizes also have different scales. So equipment operators. So you need to inform yourself and your accounting people to know what the prevailing wages are for the work that your company is going to be providing on this project. So there's also uh, something that you know, is a ratio of laborers to finishers or helpers to journeymen. You know, you know if you can't to save a few, to save some money, you can't call everybody a laborer and only have one finisher. So there's ratios. Make sure you understand that um, how how many um, journeymen or or the higher paid skills are on the job site as opposed to laborers and helpers. So uh, step three is timekeeping. Um, so you you can do you can do paper time paper time sheets. It's, um, some people do you know, spreadsheets and using Excel or whatever. There's a lot of apps now. Um, T-Sheets is now QuickBooks Time. So if you're using QuickBooks, we see QuickBooks most often. There is an app now that your employees can have access to that helps them uh, clock in and clock out. And you can program the times, that, or the, I'm sorry, the projects and the tasks they're allowed to perform. There's an approval process and synchronizes with your payroll system. So I highly recommend digital timekeeping. Again, know the job classifications your workers will be doing. You know, this is again, you know, labor rates, concrete finishers, and so on. And some workers may fall into several classifications in one day. This is tricky, and that's why having a timesheet that has the codes on it helpful in advance. You know, because each of those classifications you know, probably are different pay rates. So. There's many different platforms and methods to do this, and but your leaders in the field have to insist on compliance so that you, know, you can't let it um, can't let it slide. Part of this is you know, so what's what workers are not covered, or what workers are not um, part of um, Davis-Bacon regulations. Uh, next slide, yeah. So people, mostly you know, administrative type people, um, are not uh, covered by Davis Bacon regulations. These people may or may not get paid the same, or but it doesn't matter. They're not um, covered by these regulations. A foreman may not be covered by Davis Bacon, depending on what duties they perform. Um, but if, it's probably easier if you do pay your Davis Bacon wages to your foreman, but. Uh, People in the office are exempt. Uh, timekeepers, inspectors, architects, engineers, stuff like that are exempt. Um, but to be uh, a foreman must super to be called a foreman. See, there must supervise at least two full-time laborers. So you can't just, you know, make sure you understand, you know, who's exempt and who's not, as you set up your payroll systems. Okay, so. And it's important to know uh, what the site of work means. So the Davis-Bacon regulations apply only laborers or mechanics employed directly on the site of the work. You know, this, this, you know the site of work is defined in the bid letting, you know, the DOT will have the clarification. You know, so if your um, you know, uh, picture here shows you know, then a, a large area, that construction site may be five miles long. So working inside those areas would, you know, comply with Davis-Bacon regulations. Or if a worker is splitting their time between two job sites, you know, very common in trucking, right? One project is governed by Davis-Bacon, the other was not. And you must be able to track the employee work hours separately to make sure you're compliant. 
Yeah. So I think we, yeah. So making sure you know what's, you know, what's um, part of the job site, what isn't. Um, so the home office is not, branch locations are not, application plants, tool yards, etc. Unless it's been set up for the job. If you have a set up an office adjacent to the job site that was made just for the job, then it is part of the it is part of the site. So again, very complicated. Again, for trucking companies, this is um, takes a lot of tracking to make sure you're compliant. Again, so a company yard or shop is not considered a job site. Um, time spent traveling to or from a job site can be paid differently than Davis Bacon wages. You know, the workers' time sheet has to reflect that. So, you know, making sure we understand that. Site of the worker. So, apprentices, trainees, and helpers. You know, you can, you know, apprentices and trainees get paid a lower wage, right? You know, so that's, they can be employed if they're, if it's specified in the approved program or the full amount of the uh, fringe benefits is listed on the wage determination. If, you know, so you have the ratio between apprentices and um, journeymen. Same with helpers. You know, you have to have, uh, uh, you can't have everybody be called a helper and have one leader uh, and call and meet meet the exemption for this. So make sure you understand the ratio that's required and that you pay people accordingly. So. So, are you do you have apprentices, trainees, or helpers? And what's your ratio between those and the journeyman and the uh, higher skilled uh, jobs jobs on on the project? So that's step step four is understanding the wages and fringe benefits, um, the base hourly rate, as we say, and fringe benefits. These are the prevailing wages and the minimum pay that these people must must get. Uh, some of the fringe benefits can be discharged, though, by contractor contributions made to a third party, to a bona fide fringe benefit plan or program, and the contributions paid by employer are, irre are irrevocable. For example, if your company has a benefit plan for its workers, the funds the company pays for its share of the benefits can help satisfy or discharge all or part of the fringe benefit requirement. If your company has a 401k or a simple plan, Employees must be vested immediately and there's no waiting period. So if a, a person works for a month and they've contributed to it, they that money is, is theirs if they should leave the company. So so the next on the next slide, um, know how to pay your fringe benefits. So you can pay them as cash. That's, but maybe your company has benefits and you want to offer those to these employees and you want to be able to convert. Um, some of those benefits as a contribution is being, being paid as cash. Okay. The fringe, fringe benefits must be paid weekly for all hours, hours worked. Um, cash wages, if you pay somebody more than the prevailing wage, some of that can be applied against the fringe benefit. Service Contract Act, which is another labor uh, program under the federal government, um, can't do that. So, and also this fringe rate for over 40 hours is not time and a half, it's straight rate. So if you pay in more than the prevailing wage, we see employers who do from time to time, part of that can go against the uh, fringe benefit obligation defined in the prevailing wage. Let's look at an example. Sometimes those are the easiest. So if the base hourly range is $10, and the um, prevailing wage requires a dollar in fringe benefits, and the total total prevailing wage is eleven dollars. And you may comply by paying, as we show there, eleven dollars in cash wages. So you can pay ten dollars in wages and a dollar in fringe benefit, or you can pay nine dollars in cash wages plus two dollars in fringe benefits. So let's talk about some of those fringe benefits you might offer. Maybe you offer life insurance or Health insurance is very common. Maybe you have a pension plan, or you have paid vacation or holiday or sick leave. So those, if you're offering those benefits and your employees taking advantage of those, you can um, apply the payments you're making to the fringe benefit requirement on the, on the wage determination report. 
Okay, so there's, there's some some fringe benefits plans are are bonafide and, and they're made to third party trustees or insurers that are, the money is irrevocable, I mean that the employer can't get the money back. They're made regularly, not less often than quarterly. Sometimes they're usually done monthly. The credit is for payments made for individual workers is, is eligible to participate in the plan or the program. So how about if this one, contributions to purchase company stock? You know, they would have to have advanced approval as to be make sure it's an eligible type of benefit. What if the employee doesn't participate in funded fringe benefits? Then what? Then you're obligated to pay the full fringe benefit as published in the prevailing wage report. Next one um, on this part though is um, how to convert a benefit to an hourly wage or an hourly pay. In determining the hourly cash equivalent credit for fringe benefit payments for each individual employee, the period of time to be used is the period covered by the contribution. For example, for June monthly health insurance contributions, all hours worked during the June health coverage period must be used. It's imperative that the total hours worked by each individual employee be used as a divisor to determine the rate of contribution per hour since employees may work various hours, number of hours on both Davis-Bacon and non-government work. So let's look at this example here that, so your company policies will pay three-fourths of the employee's portion of the health insurance, three-fourths. And let's, for illustration, the employee's monthly premium is $600. For 75% of that, the company is going to pay $450 a month. Okay, number of hours worked in the month, for an example, let's say in four weeks, this person worked 160 hours. That's $2.82 an hour in benefits that the company's offering and paying to a third party that's irrevocable that can be credited against the $3.50 an hour. So the company would owe the, this worker in this example an additional 68 cents per hour um, in the form of fringe benefits. So the, the, the payroll department has got to you know, calculate that each month. And so that, that is some... That is some added work, but it's important if you're offering those benefits, which helps attract workers, you want to have credit for it when you when you write their paychecks. Now there's the computing overtime pay. This person works 44 hours as a truck driver. The wage determination base hourly rate is $22 and $4.50 in fringe benefits. So the 44 hours times the 450. So there's no overtime rate, right? For the fringe benefits. It's all straight, straight time rate. 44 hours times $22 an hour. And then the half time, half, half time and a half, excuse me, for the four hours um, for $44. So the gross pay is $12, $1,210 on this, in this example. So I guess the, the message here is that Fringe benefit is paid at straight pay, not time and a half. Um, step five, make sure that you have the processes to support certified payroll. You know, so here's, you know, type of work performed. Make sure you get the right classifications. And you know the, you know the wage, de wage determination for that. Uh, number of hours worked, um, both straight and overtime. Wage rate for the classification. And the actual payment to the worker is verifiable. You know, the employee pay stubs match the certified payroll records. Seen a couple of companies where they don't match, not even close. And then how, so you just, if you're doing these steps, it, it just, information just gets built. So, you know, so you've got to, you know, the employees have to been show, have to be shown how to record their time card daily. You know, superintendents have got to follow through. And work times sometimes are entered days later by memory. That's tough. Or, you know, your wage rates have got to be programmed correctly. in the payroll system resulting in pay and payment errors. So as we said, this, this is not just a bookkeeping thing. It's not just the responsibility of the people in the field. This it takes everybody to um, gather this information. 
We also need to talk about what deductions are allowable. So example, some of the, you know, when you um, create paychecks, the computer will program deductions, and many of them are allowable, they're standard, you know, payroll taxes of the employee's portion of their uh, health insurance premium. Um, if the employees are contributing to a bona fide uh, savings plan. Sometimes garnishments are ordered by court. Those are allowable deductions. Um, sometimes the employers will provide housing and transportation. Some of those are deductible, some of them aren't. So make sure you know which, which are. Um, if you're loaning money to an employee and you're paying it back and de you're deducting that, those are gray areas and I would really recommend you avoid those if possible. Another one, you know, sometimes they they damage a piece of equipment or they wreck their vehicle or you're trying, you think the employee should pay for that mistake. It's not an allowed, allowable deductible, you know, in this case. So just, just, just saying. So kind of get yourself ready for that. And these are some examples of allowable deductions. Um, if they're not on this list, you really want to check before you make a deduction from an employee's paycheck. Um, the agencies can do on-site interviews. So if we go to the next slide, they can come to the job site and they can interview the employees and see what they're doing and what duties they perform, what they, do they do any supervision? You know, sometimes it's because of the, um, someone complained maybe that the U.S. Department of Labor and Wage and Hour is the agency that's in charge of Davis-Bacon wage and, and fringe benefit compliance. But your state um, OJT or Department of Labor will come out and do this on-site um, interview. So just, just so you know, they, that can happen. It's kind of a couple companies with that's they've had the auditors on their job site. Um, step six is programming your payroll software. Um, remember, the payroll items need to match the Davis Bacon prevailing wage description and hourly rate. Okay, so if it says if it says concrete finisher on the prevailing wage, you need to have a payroll item that says concrete finisher, so it matches. So if there's any question, it's the same thing. And you put this in their employee's profile, it'll come up by default when you enter in the hours. And there's you know, options when you use the timesheet when you enter hours, which will make this easy. If you're using some of the new apps that synchronize with your payroll, it does that in the background. Really encourage you to look at those. Fringe benefits are the same thing. Those could be programmed in the employee's profile to automatically populate. So the setup on that part is really helpful. Then the employees pay stub need to mirror certified payroll records as we, as we said. So, so programming your payroll software, you know, having your bookkeeping people in the loop as you um, look at some of these jobs, wage determinations come out, wages and the job titles are there. Again, make sure the payroll item is, says the same as the wage determination, okay? So I did that, we'll print on the employee's paycheck so they'll see it, okay, so. Yeah, use the detailed timesheet to create the paycheck. So here, this example, we've got Chris Pepper. Um, he worked um, on Sunday, this week starts on Monday through Sunday. I think the Department of Labor goes Sunday through Saturday, but he worked um, Sunday, he worked on this, the Heather house, and then he worked out on Albert's, Albert Cottage a couple days. Uh, then he, quality built construction, that's the that's his employer. There's some shop time for Thursday. You know, that's a different type of breakout. And then worked at another project on on Friday. So you can see the timesheet. We have what job was it? What was the task performed? What was the payroll category? And what hours by day and by job? Right, so you want to have that this timesheet. This is QuickBooks. Um, really helps you know complete the requirements of the certified payroll. Okay. Step seven of certified payroll includes the following information: name and the worker's classification. 
state hourly rate of pay and cost just or fringe bona fide fringe benefits or crash equivalents paid for the benefits daily and weekly number of hours worked deductions made the actual wages paid and is certified there's a um, by the owner or their representative that wages and benefits are complying with the Davis Bacon regulations want to mention here again that um, you're going to also want to have in addition to the hours worked per day you're going to want to have a record signed by the employee of clock in and clock out whether it's digital or actually signed you know having compliant payroll records includes clock in and clock out times certified payroll has a full social security numbers and home addresses are not on the report maybe just the last four digits of their social security number you do have to maintain those records of course for any payroll compliance um, payrolls every week right and you have to submit the records within seven calendar days of the payment date prime contractors responsible for submission of payrolls by all subcontractors we said this earlier you know you want to make it easy for the primes to do business with you you don't want to have to help have them chasing you to get this right stuff done it's just not good for building relationships or building your business. So um, there is a form, the payroll form, WH347. Um, it's a manual form. You can, you can get it in Excel. Some people have done that. Um, and also QuickBooks will create a, it's an, if you're using QuickBooks payroll service and the full payroll, there is an option to generate a report um, through an export it creates an excel but it's, it's, it's out there statement of compliance um certified payroll may be submitted electronically with proper use of electronic signatures yeah this is the form again um this this is quickbooks generate something like this you can get this in excel you can i think it's 10 or 15 dollars to buy to buy this template if you ideally get it through, if you're doing payroll, though, you'd like to have that done electronically. Um, this is used today mostly as a worksheet or a manual timekeeping sheet. You know, you know, but most of most agencies will want certified payroll records to be submitted electronically. This form is a good illustration of how the time records and work classifications are documented. Uh, again, a few thoughts about deductions. Remember, payroll taxes. Garnishments are okay. You know, the employee's share of group insurance are allowable. Um, can't charge employees for broken tools or damage to property. They're almost always not allowed. You know, so if you're providing housing or other benefits and you want to deduct that cost of those, double check. You know, you know so you remember if you're if you're deducting for benefits that you're for health insurance or um profit sharing you know you have to show that those payments are deposited to these third parties within 30 days so no waiting period on the back of the page there is a certification that you you or your representative attest to that this is true and accurate information and um become legally liable for it. its accuracy on the next slide yeah i think there's a um, the form that needs to fill out exceptions. So, where except where fringe benefits are paid in cash, you have to explain that. Uh, summary. So we went through seven seven steps pretty quick. And again, if you're gonna, it's just it's the process. The implementation is where right. It's always the details is where compliance comes from. But you know, learn the rules and regulations, both Davis Bacon and, and the Fair Labor Standards Act of timekeeping. You know, some of the, a lot of the derivatives of all this is job costing. This is basic information to run your business. So the certified payroll, you know, was reporting as an extra step. But other than that, this timekeeping that this we're talking about here is the way a construction company should run its payroll, right? You need to break out payroll the way that these um, regulations require. And um, so you can see what jobs make money and which ones don't. You need to know the prevailing wage and benefits required for the work your team will be doing. Again, this is published in the 
wage determination when the contract is uh, put out. So you so there's no surprises there. Um, train the field staff and the office staff in their roles. Make sure you know, the people in the field understand the gravity of having these this time done accurately for each employee. Then you want to be able to learn how to, if you're offering benefits, how to uh, convert that to a cash equivalent so you can offset some of the fringe benefit costs if you're offering some, if you're offering benefits. Follow the rules, make sure your payroll processes produce compliant payroll records. Programming the county software to build compliant payroll records necessary. Yep. Then pay stubs have to match the certified payroll submissions. If they don't, you got to figure it out why they don't. They have to. They must. Um, as, as we mentioned early in, the, in our uh, session today, we get several calls from subcontractors asking for assistance because the prime contractor is holding their payment. They're holding their payment because the payroll records are not compliant, and the, and the prime contractors are at risk for not getting paid. They pay you, and they can't get this cleared up, and they might not get paid. You know, so. Um, and some of the subcontractor will often call the Office of Civil Rights and complain about the prime contractor, but the reality is the sub has not performed their part regarding certified payroll. So uh, there is prompt payment regulations and you can't withhold payment on parts that are, that are not in dispute. So anyway, be that con subcontractor that's easy to do business with. You know the rules, you follow them, the people like hiring you. We've got some links here um, for labor. There's a bunch of stuff on Davis, on Davis Bacon, uh, frequently asked questions, and there's a plethora of information that you can that you can use. So, and there's our contact information. If you have a situation unique in your business, you, you know, we're not we're not lawyers. We're not you know. Technical, technical, and sometimes even it's hard to get a straight answer from the Department of Labor if you have a question, but um, we'll sure try and maybe you can help point you in the right direction. Any questions you have about timekeeping, um, prevailing wage, how to program your software, um, or trouble getting paid from a prime, we can help you with that as well. So until next time, thank you for watching our video. Hope you got some pointers you can use. Thank you for doing business with the state of South Dakota. And thank you for tuning in today. Great. Have a great day.